welcome. Nice to, uh, that you're finally with us. Um, we're doing an introductory round, so because we had some moment of time, we could introduce uh, each other, and we will just go forward. So I will pass now the microphone because now they can hear you. Hi, my name is Aaron Ayaman, and I work in bioinformatics, and I'm mainly interested in how to use AI to create new proteins. Hi, my name is Seyed Ahmed Chivchi, um, PhD student at the Technical University of Dortmund, and um, studied computer science, but currently I'm uh, at the chair for information systems, and my uh, research is about interaction uh, with autonomous AI agents, also hyper-optimization with uh, autonomous agents or systems. Thanks. Yes, hello, my name is Andrea Schäfer. So, uh... I, together with my colleague Jonah Becher, uh, we are working for the R and V insurance company, and we are doing fraud detection, especially with uh, interesting approaches. Yeah, uh, as I address said, we are from the NV Versicherung here in Wiesbaden, uh, here in Wiesbaden, and um, yeah, we are mainly interested in fraud detection uh, in the application of fraud detection. Thank you. And my name is Richard, and uh, I'm a computer scientist. I worked in, at IBM in communication and middleware software, and since I'm retired, I attend workshops just for the fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Apropos fun, then it's time for you guys to introduce you together with your presentation, I would say. Um, Albert, and maybe you want to proceed. Okay. My name is Alperen Jan. I'm currently working at Mercedes-Benz as a, a solution architect in the IT operations department. And I'm also leading about eight students within two PhD candidates. And um, we are developing different kind of uh, digitalization projects in our plant in Berlin. Um, like Gen AI control cobot system, which we will present uh, right after the introduction, or Green Machine uh, data driven uh, method to enhance energy efficiency at machine tools. And I'm working at Mercedes since eight years right now. I had a PhD project, a huge PhD project, and writing my thesis right now down. And I hope I will finish it this year. Thank you. So then next one would be Ismail. Hi, I'm Ismail. I'm currently studying in, also in the TU Berlin in um, the master's uh, program for computer engineering, uh, computer science. And I'm also working as a working student in Mercedes-Benz in the maintenance department. And I'm currently um, working in, some, uh, in a digitalization project, which is uh, called uh, Digitale Prozesskette, as well as uh, in the uh, GEICO project, which uh, Alpern already mentioned before. Thanks. And then last but not least, Duk. Hi, my name is Duk. Um, I'm currently working in the IT department also as Alpern, but not in the same team. So I'm currently um, yeah, working on applications, two applications, and on my, yeah, on my work on my side, I'm also PhD student in the TU Dresden, and my, yeah, my topic is the, the predictive maintenance in the production and, uh, yeah, for automotive. So this is my case, and I'm currently eight years at Mercedes. So, okay. All right, thank you very much. So you see, we have a bunch of presentations, of course, but we also want to start a discussion to talk about what works, what doesn't work, what are our challenges. So we will have some time for that. And to start the discussion, we will start with the first presentation to give us input. And Ismail or Albert and Hoof, you will start. I think uh, both would be okay, Ismail. I'll let you the decision. 
Uh, yeah, we could start with Skyco. Okay. okay. I will share my screen. Yes, please. Uh, the stage is yours. Mm -hmm. So I'm not presenting it. I'm just uh, okay. a guest. <laughs> Maybe um, maybe to start with uh, with a few words to the project, we had a um, call for pitches from our uh, board member for IT uh, who asked for Gen AI projects. And back then, <clears throat> my bachelor student worked with Ismail on a rule-based Gen AI method: how to give uh, the chatbot within rules like uh, what uh, Copilot Studio uh, does today from Microsoft. If you ask for this, then answer that or then calculate this and so on. And we had the idea to combine a physical system within the Gen AI approach or a GPT model, for example. Like if we uh, tell him, hey, I want to plan a path from A to B, he recognizes the intent and uh, puts in a code block to program the robot, which will Ismail uh, explain to you later. And what we have done was we have uh, brought a business idea like, hey, how would you feel if you are a robot expert who is able to program robot using natural language instructions, which means like I said before, um, I want to that you move from left to right five centimeters and pick and place this object, for example. And this is uh, done by uh, user interface communication with an, an, uh, on smartphone a phone or on a, a notebook. And the top on that could be that we have a knowledge database which uh, where we have, for example, guidelines within our company how to program a robot within the Mercedes-Benz guideline. And so we created the uh, project Gyro or Geico. It's a generative AI controlled robot system um, where we have a universal robot uh, which we are controlling within the Azure Cloud. Do you want to go on? Uh, yes. So um, in the company, there are multiple challenges um, in regards of robot programming. Uh, firstly, it is mostly complex. Uh, uh, it is complex for the most people. And also from an industrial point of view, it is slow and cost intensive, requiring uh, the hard coding of programs and also um, in regards of uh, the process relevant into, uh, information. If you would consider um, the industrial environment, if you wanted to uh, program a robot application, even if it's only a pick and place application in regards of um, work safety, you would need a professional educated um, person who has done all the necessary steps to be able to uh, program such a pro uh, such a robot, and for that the external costs are relative high, uh, relatively high, and therefore uh, there is a strong independence on limited external resources. <clears throat> and we uh, develop this system to make the whole thing a lot easier, and. Therefore, we uh, developed a GPT-supported robotic assistant, which operates as a cobot alongside employees. And as Alpern already mentioned, it uh, communicates through natural language, either in text form or uh, a spoken language. And it creates and executes programs based on the requirements the user gave to the system. And this would uh, result in a reduction of cost and time. As I mentioned, uh, the external costs, um, there's also the point of uh, if you hire an external person and uh, he would travel from another city, there would also be traveling and hotel costs and so on. And uh, 
if uh, you could do this within the company with this robot assistant without hiring external resources, you would also increase in flexibility as well as robustness. And um, if the whole system is in the compo uh, is in the company environment, you can you can feed it internal info as well as um, company specific or production based um, knowledge. Next slide, please. So first, I wanted to go over our user interface. On the right side, we uh, can firstly see two icons. These icons indicate the connection to the robot and if the robot or the current position, position of the robot is within the safe zone. If these conditions are met, the uh, icons would be displayed as green. Otherwise, they would be red. And then obviously we have our messages uh, with the system as well as its re uh, responses to us. And uh, below that we have uh, the options to send messages, send a voice message or upload or delete documents. On the left hand side, we um, have the current uh, program as well as the option to um, rearrange the actions. So the actions that would be uh, run uh, step by step are displayed here and you could rearrange them uh, with a drag and drop feature. And below that we uh, have buttons for run the program, save the program and the cobot mode, which I will go into in the next slides, as well as add an action. <coughs> So let's talk about our IT infrastructure. So firstly, I will give a rough overview over the um, most important components, and then I will go into more detail in the next slides by um, uh, presenting the way a request is sent and processed. On the left-hand side, we have the user, which is in continuous dialogue with the web interface. Um, and the web interface uh, has included the Azure Cognitive Services, which uh, are essential for the speech synthesis for the answers of the system, as well as the speech recognition if we want to uh, give the system a voice message. And there's also a data exchange between uh, the web interface and the web server. The web server contains also our knowledge database and is the central component for managing and forwarding uh, incoming and outgoing requests. And um, with, uh, connected with the web server is our large language model, which we use to, um, on the one side, identify the user's intent, as well as um, create our robot programs, and also uh, edit the robot programs. And on the right-hand side, obviously, we have our robot, which performs then the created robot uh, programs for us. Yes, next slide. So firstly, if you wanted to create a request, you would do it uh, via the web interface. And if you would uh, create a voice message, the Azure Cognitive Services would be used to um, uh, convert them into text. And ultimately, the text is then sent to the web server where uh, the next processing is happening. Next slide, please. And the first step is to uh, send the message as it is with the request to uh, our large language model. In our case, it is GPT for all. Um, to determine the user's intent um, or classify it to one of our uh, predetermined uh, mode modes or uh, intents that we configured beforehand. And if you wanted to create a robot program, the system would go into the cobot mode, which get, uh, would give the LLM the right instructions to construct a robot program with our predefined um, format, which we uh, designed for the robot, as uh, well as um, the adaptations it is then uh, making for uh, maybe deleting a line or um, adding an action. <clears throat> After that, if uh, the robot program is 
um, <clears throat> created. If you would, uh, Apen, if you could go a little, um, one or two slides before where we could use the, uh, where we could see the user interface. <clears throat> yes, uh, two slides. Next, please. Where the user interface is seen. Yes, so we uh, have our request to move uh, 10 centimeters above point 0.9 and uh, then uh, open the grip and so on. And then the system would give us uh, the requested program. And if you would then want to run the program, you would have to either click the button or say, uh, Ausführen in this case, because uh, the system was communicating in German. And after that, the program would be run. We could also design the system to run the program automatically, which would interfere with work uh, space security issues. Therefore, we needed to hard code a way that the user ultimately decides if the program is run or not. So let's talk about uh, the <clears throat> uh, next, no. One before, please. Yes. And if uh, then the robot uh, program uh, needed to be run, the uh, server would convert the generic format that we predefined into the robot specific format that depends on wh uh, which robot um, branding you are using. We were using universal robots, but there are also KUKA and so on. And we built a translator to a uh, universal robot language, um, which our format is then um, shifted into and sent in the red protocol to the um, robot to uh, run the program command step by step. <laughs> next slide, please. So next on, we have our knowledge database. And uh, here you could either have um, two ways to request uh, information or two ways to receive information. Firstly, you can upload and delete documents um, for building up or scaling your um, knowledge database. This could be some production information or information about the robot in general. And then you would uh, maybe ask the system a question like, uh, how do I turn the robot on? And then would, uh, this would be the case one, the extraction of information from documents that are provided in the system. Mm, this would then be used to generate the output of the system. And you would uh, get like, you turn the robot on by pushing the button on the left side. And uh, you have also another case where you um, request information about the robot itself, like um, on which position is the robot currently on. And then you would, uh, the system would uh, get this information by uh, taking it from the robot controller itself and not from the knowledge database. This would be case two. <clears throat> Next, please. So now we have also provided a demo where um, we have a metallic uh, grid-like uh, shape under the robot where we have um, determined 15 uh, waypoints. And uh, now you will see that we will lay um, a pen on waypoint 9 and then a prompt the system uh, uh, to create a program to grab the pen and release it on another point. And I already prepared you the message and sent it to the system. <clears throat> and it takes a while to compile it, but uh, then you, could, you would get uh, the program and if you would run it, the robot will move and do the program. And my colleague here is already ready to grab the pen, which is then released by the robot. Yes. So uh, this was uh, an overview and uh, the presentation for our uh, robot system. Thank you for listening.
Thank you very much. Then this would be a good time to ask questions. Who wants to go first? One question uh, about, uh, do you consider also pass optimization uh, from position, starting position to final position? It's an optimal control problem, maybe? Uh, your mic is muted. Uh, yes. The, so do you consider uh, um, uh, introducing also some kind of uh, optimization solution for the pass uh, from a starting point to a final point? Yes, yes, that's the next, um, that's the, that's the next step. Uh, since KUKA and Fenok and other robot manufacturers are calculating with own algorithms of humanly perfect path, um, we have some uh, developed another method to optimize the energy efficiency of paths, mm -hmm. which we will give the uh, the uh, within the model, and uh, set a rule set. If you got a point to point movement, for example, do not this uh, do a via point um, like it's called in German überschleifen. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, go um, with a with a with a radius mm -hmm. okay thanks um do you have any benchmarks to your uh, solutions because uh, it's really interested uh, to see how your prompts get be really current uh, into the actions and mm -hmm. also be current um, the the action could be accuracy high or low and how many times do you have prompt again uh, mm -hmm. that the robot is understanding the real um, the real command also yes and it was... the also other lang uh, large language models uh, yes we uh, firstly only used uh, GPT first we used uh, GPT2 I think and this was <laughs> horrible and then we needed to update to GPT-40 and then it uh, worked a lot better. But um, real benchmarks, I would say, we don't have really. I can say that we um, have experimented a lot and our use case, our system has um, only basic uh, linear um, movements as well as grip. Uh, as well as opening and closing the grip movements. And uh, these um, instructions, it uh, understands very well uh, at this point, as well as we can uh, give an uh, offset, uh, like I said uh, in the demo, um, where we could uh, tell the uh, program to move 20 centimeter, centimeters over a waypoint. And uh, this would uh, work uh, really reliably, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. <laughs> then uh, I have uh, one question more. Um, mm -hmm. The sequence you showed us, the user interface and the program you have given as an example, is mm -hmm. kind of well structured. So it gives it kind of in a way it already is has the robot in mind that understands the robot. What happens if a user gives something more fuzzy, something more complex, or just says, just give me the pen or something like that? Have you such use cases already? Yes, we have already uh, discussed this uh, topic, but uh, to, um, to have the system learning this uh, way of understanding, you would, pro you would need to provide it very, uh, lot of examples beforehand, as well as uh, you would need to consider that there isn't any collision um, of uh, the robot movement. If it uh, tries to grab the pen maybe in uh, a given waypoint, and it would understand to move up to the pen, down and grab it. Uh, in the current state, it could not uh, consider um, obstacles in, the, in its way or something like that. Therefore, we really uh, broke it down into um, waypoint by waypoint or step by step uh, movements where it would grab uh, the pen 
um, or if we want to in, um, instruct that, we would uh, instruct very uh, clearly step by step. As I said. Well, this kind uh, of intense, like reach me out the pen or grab this, grab that, we would need a vision system, which one, recognizes the parts, and uh, two, recognizes the coordinates or calculates the coordinates with the angle of the picture and the um, actual robot state. We are on it. I think we will need some kind for uh, some time for it, but uh, it should be technologically possible to make this. Yeah. All right, then thank you very much for this presentation and the discussion. And then it's time for the next. So I assume Alperen now mm -hmm. will go on. Will. All right. I will share again. Just give me a second. Uh, okay. Um, Are we able to see something? Perfect. Okay. Um, what I will present you now is my um, PhD project, which I worked on from 2018 until 2022, 23 about. And we are now this, uh, projecting or uh, setting it up for the whole company to use this. Okay. Um, it's called Green Machine, how to enhance energy efficiency and sustainability in manufacturing with intelligent um, algorithms. Um, let's start with the motivation. Uh, about 45% of electrical power consumption in Germany is caused by the produ uh, directing or producing industry. We have challenges with rising ecological requirements and responsibility to save our planet. Efficiency and sustainability could not only lead to it, it is nowadays a success factor for, co uh, for companies. There are a lot of uh, more to motivate this topic, but let's start and take a look at machine tools and manufacturing industry, which have a huge amount of energy consumption. Um, you have to imagine uh, uh, in automotive, for example, in the manufacturing, you got uh, a big hall full of machines, uh, machine tools, uh, which are delivered by the machine manufacturers and the machine manufacturers are not adapted to the application like the, um, uh, like the producer itself. So there are a lot of hidden potentials to enhance the operating efficiency. And uh, one, uh, the machine which we are ordering in automotive, for example, are not staying for one, two years. Uh, in the median, it's about 15 years which a machine runs and does parts for us. And on the one hand, we have a long, a long run time of the machines. On, on the other hand, it could be used also after this lifespan if we enhancing the sustainability by use, uh, with using existing hardware. And there are a lot of uh, quality management uh, tools uh, which I aim to optimize the production, but which are mostly manual. And our idea was to create a data-driven approach with which we can use in the serial production. You have to um, imagine there's a lot of um, research about optimization of machine tools. But the most of uh, my research fellows are uh, looking at machines in the lab. Since they have no serial production, since they don't have any aims, how much uh, parts are should be produced. They can do very, very uh, different things within the machine, but which is not able to adapt in the serial productions. So our idea was an implementation of an optimization process during the serious production. And what, uh, what we have to <clears throat> take care about this is the so-called overall equipment efficiency. Like we have three uh, factors in our main KPI in the production, which are very important. It's the operating time, 
uh, its uh, product quality and how much good parts we have which we can use or sell. Um, and we started with a, uh, with a strategy which I could tell the pro, uh, production responsibles how do uh, want to achieve the energy efficiencies. And if you uh, if we take a look uh, how we go uh, how we uh, will make it, it's, it's very simple like a plan to check X cycle. We start to analyze the machine. We are looking for the machine and process or energy data and the operational data. How does the machine data behavior? Do we have a um, standard behavior which we can learn like, uh, like uh, with a uh, machine learning algorithm? Then after this, if we, uh, if we know that the machine is running well, we can um, define optimization measures and planning the experiments. After this, we go into the test phase where we execute the te tests under condition, uh, continuous monitoring. And um, after this, we evaluate the energy quality and process data and extending successfully uh, to different machines because we, if we got a grinding machine or a milling machine from, from one type like Juncker, we have about 15 of this and we make it stepwise, like first the, uh, first the machine, then the, uh, first the one machine, then the other machine and so on. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the architecture, how we do this. We have a machine tool which creates machine and process data. Um, this process, uh, machine and process data gives us information about the state of the machine the quality of the part and how much energy do we uh, consume. Consuming. And we do this uh, in a, within a, da a data processing where we put context in the data, like the part is, uh, the uh, quality measurement is part of this state within this energy. And we analyze this data if there, if there are any changes within our uh, manipulation or optimization effects. And an AI-based agent or rule-based agent, it's better called, uh, this, uh, <laughs> this slide was more uh, for the management at, uh, at our company, um, decides whether it is good or not, and uh, within uh, uh, with an edge device, we will send the uh, data back to the machine tool. Okay, how do we get knowledge uh, through process data? Um, we have a so-called controller or a PLC at the machine tool, which has a lot of inputs and outputs, like states, hey, is uh, the light on or off, is the uh, fluid pump on or off, and so on. And the, uh, this gives us information about how does the machine work, which temperatures are reached, which are not reached, where sh could be an anomaly, for example, usually the temperature is reached within 25 seconds and but this time it is not. We have to uh, search for the cause, why does this happen? And within our expert system, we are able to uh, define what does, me, uh, what does it mean if there, is, if there are any changes. I will get, get back to this. Um, with the the, the, norm, uh, the learning the normal behavior of the machine with historical data, like I said, we have a we have a different bunch of signals of the PLC, like I shown uh, in the slide before. We're building a target reference, uh, like the target reference uh, behaves like the uh, red one, for example, or the, the green one, for example, and if the movement is missing, we have an anomaly. And within this anomaly, we have to decide whether it is good or not. 
Therefore, we are using so-called expert systems. Like um, I've uh, brought you an example for the quality check. Hey, um, we do an optimization step. Uh, check if we uh, have a difference in quality. If yes, we can predict if we train enough data for quality defects. If it uh, if it's a quality defect, we can reset the optimization. If not, we can continue it. And there are a lot of different uh, mechanics which we have used uh, of quality management, like the um, it's called in German the beherrschter process uh, of the norm. If we are producing 50 parts uh, within this time and this quality, it is, the process is okay, and every failure it uh, which occurs is uh, random, for example. And the next challenge was to, if we do the changes within the machines, for example, we got a fluid pump, which we have, um, which we are changing the pressure of the fluid pump. We don't know how does the state uh, room uh, look like, which means for us, we have to move with caution. And our idea was to start uh, if this uh, box is a whole uh, state room, we, uh, we uh, put the whole state room in small uh, segments and start here a small. And we are doing so-called design of ex experiments to randomly look for points, which is the most energy efficient one. Like uh, we have a um, linear uh, relation between the pressure pump and the energy we know that this point is the most energy efficient one. And if we are doing the st statistical test within here and we know uh, that, that there can't occur any problems, we um, enhance our state room and the second exploration would start and so on and so on. Oops, uh, after all, um, we, Saved a lot of energy for machines within, uh, without upgrading any hardware. Um, there are further optimization potentially possible, but the main point is the OEE remained unchanged. Um, I don't know if I said it, but for a production menu uh, responsible, the main point is do not touch my OEE or do not produce any faulty parts because then he will get problems and it's not financial um, it's not financial smart to uh, produce false parts just to save five percent of energy for example thank you for your attention if you had, have any further questions feel free to ask Thank you very much. So the talk is open for discussion. Where are the questions? Um, do you use also uh, some kind of a simulation model uh, with dynamics of the robot, for example, that uh, could help you? Um, it's not a robot, it's a machine tool. Okay. And there are not exact mod uh, models or simulations of the machine tool since um, if there are any models, then only for a stationary uh, state, which means if I have five different types of pressures, which I will change the uh, simulation, don't know how the machine will behavior behave if I change the uh, pressure. Mm, okay. Um, can you explain how you measure your en uh, energy consumption? Because um, if you're using any models or uh, any um, systems, computers, and so on, um, the programming language, for example, is also depending. So if you're using any um, 
C languages, for example, it's another benchmark for some calculations, as when you're using Fortran uh, is um, not row, it's more column uh, oriented. So the calculations will be also another one. So um, do you um, implement it also in your simulation or in your um, work also something like this? like the os or programming language uh, which channels are used uh, images data or something else okay uh, the main point is we are not using this method in any kind of simulations we are doing the optimization within real production systems which uh, produce parts which we are using for other uh, for every car of uh, our production line um we are uh, how do i we are measuring the energy within the energy meter which is connected to the machine and since we uh, the energy data in one hertz we are mqtt to our iot broker within our iot broker i get the uh, data um, I grab the data from an Azure uh, cloud instance and where we are uh, where I am processing it and put it into to context within a, my production data. Okay, thanks. Okay. With how many parameters are you doing that you have shown us um, as a two? but it looked as if only one had an impact on the energy efficiency. Um, my experience, we have, uh, for example, a standard machine tool has five sub aggregates uh, and three uh, of them are, um, are good to optimize and three, uh, um, the uh, most um, values which we have uh, had optimized is three at, at this time. Like the pressure pump, the temperature, and the uh, uh, RPM of an, another electrical motor. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Then I would have one. It goes to uh, Alperin and you, Ismail. It's about the challenge and practice. So you have conducted both uh, project on this kind of uh, tooling machine. What is an actual practical application of machine learning models challenge, or how do you deal with the common challenges in such a um, manufacturing environment? There are two, ty uh, two types of uh, challenges. Opinion. The one um, challenge is the operational challenge, which means, hey, I have to, um, I have to talk with a production responsible that my method is not any rocket science; it is uh, gaining efficiency within our production. The second one is also the data quality, which means. Um, Everybody talks about data in the production, but nobody has a consistent, uh, consistent data quality, which guarantees me that I have every data that I'm needing for my models to train, for example. And how, how do you identify those or how can you tackle those? If you occur, have this kind of problem, then... Um... In the current production environment, it's hard for you to get this data just out of the blue, right? You cannot modify much on the machine. You cannot stop the production. You cannot send an investigation team that stops production. So what can you do in such a kind of situation? You have to explain the value of the data within the production responsibles and even with the machine workers, which are on the machine who have a, an eye for this data. Like, um, I I will uh, I always go into our halls and talk to the machine uh, machine guys and tell them, hey, if you guarantee me that we will get data, I can um, prevent you from any headache uh, within or any ma uh, unplanned maintenance problems and so on. And if you talk to them and explain why it is so important, I think you will. Um, like and Deutsch said, uh, 
Äh, wir äh, rennen in offene Türen. <lacht> <lacht> But you have to activate them and show them that is a very important challenge what we have do uh, what we have uh, today and we have a lot of opportunities with data it's not meaning that we are saving any manpower and so on it, uh, i think we are um, giving them a better life like it's like on the iphone if we are uh, if he asks me hey Uh, you uh, do you want to go to home because the last five uh, weeks you always gave them in the navigation your home address at this um, at this uh, time and it is some kind of the same like if I have a flag in the PLC which could tell me that my machine is going to into a malfunction I could send a push notification Uh, we are mail, for example, to the responsible of the machine. I see. So, thank you very much. And let's thank our speakers. And now we have time for the next presentation. Luzi, I will prepare your PDF slides. Okay. Okay. Okay, this works. Nice. Hi. Yeah, as I introduce myself, um, I hope you can hear me online. I guess so, hopefully. Um, I work at Technical University Berlin together with Stefan. And I work in the realm of statistical homogenization method, which are concerned if you look at heterogeneous materials. So most of the time, the materials I look at look something like this. So I'm concerned with two-phase materials. So materials consisting of a material matrix and some inclusions. And I'm interested in the material response to loading. Um, Usually it's not that easy to calculate the response to loading of such, ma such materials since the material constant change from point to point and the response of the material changes from point to point. And also each individual material has a specific behavior, but it changes in the composite. So there are several different ideas you can use and I'm working on the statistical approach and the first thing I had to do was to think about how can I make the material more abstract how can I produce abstract materials I can actually work with and this was what I came up with so I'm interested in mostly isotropic materials so I decided to use circular inclusions this is quite common in the literature to do um, and as you can or as I wrote um, under the pictures. Uh, these two materials both have around 40% of inclusions, but the inclusions look quite different and are um, distributed randomly throughout the microstructures. So how can I handle these different appearances? Um, I can, for example, use statistical homogenization to deal with such a problem. This is just one idea. You can use many, but this is what I work on. So what's the background? So if I'm interested in the response of a material to loading, I'm usually interested in the effective elasticity tensor. And you can um, define it like this. So you have such an equation, C, the big C is the effective elasticity tensor, the small C is the local tensor. You usually can't calculate because it changes so rapidly throughout the structure. And um, therefore, 
we introduce some volume average. This is the first step you can always make if you do some homogenization task. You use a volume average. This is also um, called a one point statistics since you're using one point. Okay, and since I'm in this isotropic and nice and linear elastic um, setting, I can assume that throughout my microstructure, the changes are not that big. So I can introduce some perturbation term, um, allowing me to waddle only slightly from the average. And I can write it down like this. And if I plug everything together, um, I get this equilibrium equation for this homogeneous comparison medium now. Um, this is a differential equation, and I can solve this differential equation, for example, using some Green's function theory. Um, most of the times you don't know how these Green's functions look like, but in this case, we actually have some representation of such function. Okay. But I wanted to introduce statistics into the problem since I only have the volume average at the moment, which gives me only a one-point statistic, which deals only with the um, amount of material um, concerned in the microstructure. So what I do is introduce a two-point probability function, which you can visualize something like this. So you choose two material points randomly within the structure and use a measure the distance and you see where you land in the material. And you can do that over and over and over again for different distances, which ends up looking something like this. Um, so here we have our material um, properties. And these guys back here, these Fs, are my statistical functions. So these are conditional probability functions. Um, and for example, the first probability functions, function that gives me the probability of this point R prime being in state H1, which could be interpreted as material one, under the condition that the other point is also in this material. And since I have two materials, I get four functions, four conditional probability functions. And I can plug them into my problem. Um, I denoted this big function block over there, up there as f. I convoluted with the Green's function, and now I have a statistical homogeneous problem I can solve, which is nice. Um, but we still are, have to deal with the problem that we don't know the probability functions, and it's not that easy to extract these probability functions from the materials. Um, so the first question is, what kind of properties do these functions have? Um, so we can use basic statistics to look at these functions, which gives us the first um, line and says that we have four probability functions, which are absolute probabilities, um, and they're just the conditional ones divided by the volume fraction of each material, which is nice. The second property we always have in this isotropic setting is that P12 and P21 be have to have to be the same since it's orientation independent. Okay, we can also pass to the limits um, and passing to the limits um, is for passing to zero quite easy since passing to zero means that we are only in one point which immediately gives us the one-point statistics and passing to infinity gives, gives us the expectation value, which is quite nice. And we also know that all these functions has to sum up to one. We are still concerned with the probability function. But how do we ex extract such functions from the microstructure? So the classical method is that you do the statistical experiment on your structure. So you use a bunch of different vectors, in these cases, orientation independent vectors, and you put them into the microstructure, and you see where the ends of these vectors land, in which 
material and do that over and over and over again. Um, which gives okay results. Um, and you can get quite good results in these cases when you're using 200 different distances and you put them at 400 random points and you basically rock around in, I think, 10 degree steps or so. This gives us good result, but it's quite time consuming, actually. So the first step to cut computational time is to see how fast we can reach the limit going to infinity, and it actually reached at about 20% of the length of the microstructure. So we don't have to do the calculations for um, distances spanning the whole microstructure. It's okay to stop at 20% because we reach the limit early. And the results then look something like this. So we get four probability functions. These looking quite quite good down here. And in the in the first example, you see that sometimes there's still some differences between P12 and P21, but not too big of a difference. It's quite okay. And you also see two characteristics here, which are will be important later on. So in the second example, you see that we don't have a prominent minimum or maximum in any of these functions. But in the first example, we do have a prominent minimum or maximum. So this change in monotonicity will get important later. OK, so the idea was that it's, first of all, time consuming and quite difficult to extract these functions um, from the microstructures. So why don't we use some machine learning to try to make it faster and more accurate? Um, this gives us some challenges. One of the biggest challenges is that input and output space look quite differently. So in input space, we have some microstructure images, and as an output space, we have a function. Mm. So we need to find some way to extract the information from both data types. And we also have the problem that technically this function space, which is our output space, is infinite dimensional. So how do we deal with that problem? So the first idea was a pretty basic idea, which didn't work, to just use a convolutional neural network to extract the functions, since convolutional neural networks um, extract correlations from in images. So the basic idea was in the first try that these correlations could be the correlations we are looking for. Um, turned out, in the cases I tried, it didn't work. And I tried a lot of cases. But introducing some fully connected network, learning the overall basic structure of the probability function led to convergence and gave us some, some okay results. Um, I start with around 400 sample images and it was working okay, and the network didn't work at all. So it was like um, no conversion, it was just random points, and it didn't go away. Um, and the results looked something like this. So still not super smooth down here, um, but we were able to approximate the monotone behavior of a specific class of correlation functions quite okay. But we had some problems here. We are not able to see good results for this prominent minimum problem. So the next step was to introduce something that helps us dealing with this problem that we are not able to have good results in this part here. So the obvious next step was to introduce some other fully connected layers after the addition of the results of these two um, networks in the front 
and then pass it back. And this worked better, much better. So the, the, the critical point at this stage was to um, reduce the batch size. That helped a lot. It didn't help in the first in, in the second try. The um, it didn't read too too much better results. And to tweak the standard MSE loss I used in the examples before. Um, to have some more impact of this part down here. And this led to these results. They are much smoother. Now I was able to see better results in more wide classes, I would say, of monotone functions. So usually the, the behavior of the function is always the same. So we start at the volume fraction of the, of the for example, polymer matrix. The um, probability decreases rapidly, and then we reach somehow the limit. But the point where we reach the limit is always a little bit different. And I had a lot of good results in this part, but you still can see here, I have no good picture of this prominent minimum problem. And sometimes it was a good result, but a lot of the times um, there were some hit or miss results regarding those functions. And I'm still working on that problem. It's getting better, but I'm not there yet. So. If you have any good ideas, I'm like happy to hear them. Yeah. So to sum it up, what did I do or what did my um, supervisor Sandra Kling and I do? Um, we replaced these monotone two-point probability functions for two-phase microstructures for microstructures with around 35 to 45 percent inclusions with some neural network structure. Um, and we built that, and I didn't stress out on that, inspired by neural operators. So the idea was since we actually have this infinite dimensional output function space to adapt the overall structure of a neural operator, this gave us the idea to split up um, the task into two uh, neural networks and then add them together later on, pass the loss then back to both of the networks. Um, but still, this was a discretized version. I didn't do it in this infinite dimensional setting, but I still discretized the problem. So open questions are still capturing the non-monotonal behavior. It's still not fully solved yet. What about bigger volume fractions in the network? Can I expand? Um, the volume fractures, um, the, the microstructures covered in one network without losing um, a lot of accuracy and not blowing up the computational time. Um, and what about real neural operators? This is what I'm currently working on and what one of my students is working on, actually. Um, he's working on basically the first two problems. Yeah, so do I have another slide? No, thank you for your attention. Um, and I hope you have some questions or ideas. Thank you very much. So now what are your questions about this talk? Very excited. Also, the online audience, of course, we are happy about your question as well. Just start talking. Yes? So you have this um, infinite function output space, but is it actually infinite? Or because from the examples that you showed, it could always be described by a couple of numbers and own um, bounded numbers also, and a list of predefined um, distributions, basically. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused about that, if, if it's really... So 
um, the concept is that function spaces are always infinite dimensional. That's the baseline here. But what I did, and this is true, I discretized the problem. So at the end, I worked with 200 data points of the function and interpolated between the function points. That's, that's true. But like the idea behind that is if you want to use a PDE with neural operators, you define the operator going from the input function space, I don't know, C2 or C infinity or something like that, going to usually some L2 space. And the idea behind that was to adapt this idea to work on this problem. Um, but there's also research, and that's true also, um, who define, um, I guess I, I read that a couple of days ago, no, a couple of weeks ago, um, where they build a pool of functions and they wrote a network picking functions from the pool of functions and just combining them. But they still didn't solve the problem how to define the pool of functions. That's still a problem. Um, hard code is that? Hard code is the, hard code is the, the pool of functions and, and put variables on them. I, I think I have heard something very similar like five years ago in a lecture at U Darmstadt, but I, um, of course, don't remember um, any. Very happy to to see the the lecture notes or the paper yeah. or something that's concerned with this problem. Because if 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 that would be possible to reduce that to um, to a finite list of functions that have one or two variables each that are all, all also finite, then that would, of course, make that problem far more easy. And you would also resolve this I'm, problem. I'm sorry, I'm still confused what you mean with the word finite regarding functions. Um, Can you okay. explain that um, a little bit more? If, if you, normally your function space is infinite. If you yes. have no, but, if, but in, in all the examples that you showed, we can already exclude some functions because they are certainly not in our target range. So, for example, we um, we would always have some. Um, I think most of your functions could have, when you removed a little bit of noise, you could always imagine them as polynom. And if you assume that it's always it's a polynom still infinite of infinite dimensional space, if you assume that it's a polynom of only three elements and each. Um, each uh, alpha has a bounded space, which is also the case, at least in your examples, it was always bounded like um, this This um, picture that you took, it was only 255 times 255 pixels. So your maximum length is, is bounded. And then you can also have a bounded function space. I think we talk about different things here. I also think so. <laughs> Let's discuss that later on. May, may I interrupt for a moment? Um, in the end, what this motivates would be the idea to look into kolmogorov arnold networks or in a Ritz method, uh, as much as I understand you. Um, so I, I find this idea striking, but there's another problem we have here, which is that coffee break starts at <laughs> half past, which is the ideal option to discuss the problem in detail. And after the coffee break, we will come back here for the last talk, we will, where we will open another three topics, and then we have time for a big final discussion. And um, yeah, then we want to really have participation of the plenum and go into the mathematical details. So I suggest, um, we look for some more questions now, and then we proceed to the coffee break in uh, building A together. Any more questions? Okay, then let me check. I think I, I have one, one question to the network structure. You have a, an addition of the two neural networks before the final uh, fully connected layers. Um, have you tried 
just passing both neural networks as inputs, like concatenated inputs into the final layer? Maybe, but probably not. I don't know. I tried so many things. But what I know is that I tried multiplication and that didn't work at all. And I have no clue why, but this is machine learning. So, yeah. All right. Then, thank you very much. Let's thank her again. And to the online audience, we will be back in about one uh, half an hour. No, wait a second. We have one hour to drink coffee, uh, GI says. And at 4.30, we will be back and have the last talk and the big plenary discussion. Okay, see you later. All right. Okay, <clears throat> so we are a small number of people. That means if you have questions, just go. <laughs> um, otherwise, we will follow the presentation, which is about machine learning methods in solid mechanics. And let's see what's in there. Okay, they told me it might have a delay, but so much. Now it's working. Okay, good. So let's talk about material modeling a little bit. And let's start with the strain split in an elastic and plastic part. So maybe to go for those who are not from solid mechanics into the question what is strain? That is the spatial derivative of deformation or displacement field. So we split our strain in an elastic and plastic part, and we know from the material behavior that the trace of the plastic strain tensor is always zero. We have Hooke's law, which is giving us stresses dependent on strains, but only in the purely elastic part. So we can do the contraction with Hooke's uh, tensor and the elastic strain tensor. And then the question is, when I deform something, when will it be elastic and when will it be plastic? I mean, if I play around with this here, or then, then you have seen how easy it is to deform metal plastic heli. And this question can be answered for most metals by the von Mises flow rule, which is the deviatoric part of the stress tensor minus a backstress tensor minus a yield limit. The yield limit can vary over time. The backstresses can accumulate. And that means the question when plastic strain will or plastic yield will occur is not unique. It might change depending on the deformation that a material has seen before. Also, we can have a quite complex evolution of the backstresses. There can be multiple backstress terms and so on. When we look into some more specific ideas about plastic flow, we discover the associativity, which means that plastic flow only goes into the direction normal to the yield function, normal to the yield limit described by the yield function. So it is this we basically have the potential, which is coincidentally the yield function itself. And we have some multiplier, delta lambda, which we don't know a priori. So we have to find a rule so that the yield function, the flow rule, is fulfilled again after yielding. Furthermore, that brings us to the following conditions. The plastic multiplier can only be larger or greater or equal zero. The flow function, the flow rule says the flow function value must never be greater than zero. And the multiplication of both is always zero. So either we have plastic flow and the yield function is exactly zero, or we don't have plastic flow, then the delta lambda is exactly zero. 
And finally, here's an example for a model how the back stresses develop, which is the Armstrong Frederick model. And if you combine everything together and simulate it, then we have the strain in one axis here and the stress in the other axis here. And this is roughly the shape you get. Here we have tension and from here on we see plastic yield. The yield limit increases because of kinematic hardening. Then we go back, have again the elastic um, way back. And then we go into the compression and then we have an earlier yield, plastic yield, because the yield limit moved a bit over towards the upper limit. And then we go back and we can do this in a cyclic way as well. And when you play this with, for example, this tooth saw movement, then you can have this kind of ratcheting effect so that the curve moves to the right over time. The significance of this is that this kind of material behavior is shown in some steels used in automotive industry where you have um, big bending processes for metal sheet forming. You have it in 3D printed and other aluminum alloys. And in general, you want to know when a material will still be in an acceptable shape or when it will reach some ultimate tensile strength, strength. So when will it fail? And how will it behave until it fails? What are the deformations to expect? So because all those formulas are kind of complicated to determine, which means that measurement and conventional modeling is quite extensive, the suggestion is use a neural network. Our setup looks like this. We give in the total strain at the current time step, the last known plastic strain, the last known back stresses, and then calculate the plastic increment and the back stress growth. And then we do some more processing, which gives us in the end the plastic current um, the strain tensor, the elastic part, the stress tensor, and the current back stresses, which completely solves the plastic task. To do this, the loss function values that we set up are data-driven, of course, which means that we compare the, uh, the increment for the epsilon uh, for the plastic strain tensor with the increment that we have in our data set. Same for backstress increment. So we need some surrogate data to train with backstresses because they are not easily observable. And we have, we can also compare the uh, stress data, which is quite well measurable. Furthermore, we can regularize with the conditions that both tensors, epsilon plastic and chi, the backstress tensor, have to be trace free. That is uh, their standard plastic behavior. And we can um, ensure that the flow condition after the plastic update is met, that the direction is the same that we expect, which means associative, so normal to the yield surface. And finally, uh, sorry. That is, yeah, that is the associativity. And L flow plastic means, yeah, the other condition after flow, we have to be exactly zero. And before, when we have a purely elastic step, we can be maximally zero. Okay. Then we have set up a bunch of neural networks, which do all possible, no, not all possible combinations, but take all of those loss values and then leave out one. We have a purely data-driven version A, and we have three network architectures. One network architecture is one sigmoid layer for leaky ReLU and one other sigmoid layer. The other one is purely ReLU and purely tangent hyperbolicus. Altogether, 80 uh, epochs, batch size 64, 64 neurons per layer, so comparably small networks to what we have seen here so far. 
um, simple mean square error loss and some atom optimizer with decreasing learning rate. What does that give? That gives the need to generate training data. We have to train them with a smooth function. We cannot say, I set up my data with random, totally random spots. That would be a very weird behavior. It does not happen in measurements. It does not happen in reality. And it doesn't converge in conventional numerical models. So I need smooth curves. So I take a Gaussian random process generator and generate six independent functions, which are good for the six independent values of my tensor. And I generate a lot of them, which are 2,000 points in each line, 10 patches, or so 20,000 such history, strain histories, and those from those I have made 480. And those 480 strain stress histories are pre-calculated and used as a data set. That is a bit of data. And we have to scale it so that the upper value is about 10 times the yield limit so that we have enough data in the plastic regime. Now, we train it, we see the loss values. They saturate basically after 11 epochs. So 80 epochs is more than enough. Yeah. Say again. Ah, so I showed the input side of the training data, the strain curves. And then I take a conventional um, material model, the Armstrong-Frederick model, which, is, which has a conventional implementation. And the output of this is the stress data and the back stress data, or the plastic increment. Whatever you want to, you can get it out. And this classical model is exact? It's not exact. No, it's also an approximation, but it's a fairly good one, which is suitable to generate surrogate data. The goal is here only to uh, validate the method. In the end, I have to use actual measurement data if I want to be beat this uh, baseline of the conventional modeling, obviously. The other problem is that the measurement does not give me automatically the back stresses, which is part of the outlook later on. So I have to deal with the um, reduction of data, the expected reduction of data, which will take the backstress information away from me. For the moment, that's the start. OK. So now we see, OK, the regularizing loss parts are, oops, huh? that's too much. Um, the, regular, the regularizing loss contributions are fairly small compared to the data-driven losses here and here. Interesting is that the uh, sigma loss is not really going down, but I assume it has to do with the fact that the biggest share of the stresses is contributed by the elastic response and only small differences are uh, yeah, stem from the plastic behavior. So maybe this part of the loss function um, needs to be adapted to be of more significance. But since we have the uh, data for the plastic increment in the strains, which is the same information like the stress, inf um, stress loss, that still guides the network quite well. But it turns out we needed the regularizations. So let's look into it. This is model A, purely data-driven, and you see when you have such a swelling um, deformation that slowly, slowly the cyan curve has a drift from the black target curve. And so for cyclic stability, we cannot use it. At some point, it will drift away. Model B has excellent performance. And when you look closely, the other models are more or less good or also have some drift. But in the end, at least here at around 48, 50 uh, data points, there is at least a small, um, yeah, what, not singularity, there's a small deviation that would grow uh, over more epochs. Only model B, which is 
looked into for more cycles as well, shows not, no such drift and no such problem. Similarly, model C, but model C has one more value in the loss function, which is the associativity of the flow rule. But it seems we don't need it. And so why calculate it during training? Now, the next uh, example, we're still in the same same field. Here are some more uh, versions, model I, J, R, and T. I and J have the same behavior like discussed before, but the purely ReLU layer has a significant drift and the uh, Tangens hyperbolicus model totally deviates, so it's absolutely less performant or close to useless for the task. Now, let's have another check back to the results into two direction. We have not only to check the one one direction, we have to check the two two direction of the strain and stress. This model performs also in the same accuracy. And now we can check in the shear direction one two. And you can see here the values have the order of magnitude of 10 to the power of 7. And our main values are in the order of magnitude of 10 to the power of 9. So we are here in the, on average, with a deviation of a percent or less than a percent. And this is good enough. The spread in measurement data ranges for this kind of data around 5%. So our network can learn in a higher accuracy than the measurements are even, so that's good enough. But um, the yield limit actually ranges in a range from 20%, which is a bit um, surprising, but the official data sheets give 20% of range. Now we have a share test. And you can see, okay, model B and C go into a stable deviation of maximum 19%, um, but they're stable. Model A, not so sure, it was not stable in the first test. And all other models are at some point instable. So we can rule those other architectures out and see that we need all the regularizing parts of the loss function. Now here is a little more complex uh, deformation state where we pull in two directions, no, in all three directions and the shear directions. And we can see, okay, the red curve here is met very well by the sine curve. So we met, meet our target data. And also in the strain stress state, you see the biggest deviation is in the shear direction. All other directions are met very well. And also you see how complicated it might be. The long-term stability is given, especially since also the back stresses here are met properly and show no signs of any drift. Okay, now the question from you. <laughs> the big problem is data hunger and that the measurement usually gives us uni-actual testing, not six-dimensional random plots where I have any uh, direction given. Also, nobody measures back stresses. Okay, I have to admit in the one uh, uni-actual case, I can recover the back stresses analytically, so I can do something about that. But on the other hand side, I have the fact that the direction of flow, the direction of the back stresses cannot be trained easily. So I'm working on it. Um, the data sets are extremely small compared to what we want in machine learning. That's the biggest problem. They gave us from this DFG um, work from 1997 to 2001, they measured at uh, our partners at Leibniz IWT in Bremen measured some aluminum alloys. And they have given me like, 20 uh, stress strain curves that are usable, that are complete data. The other ones are just cyclic data that I cannot use for, for this. So I have about 20 curves with three, four, five, maybe 10 cycles, but they are all on the same strain level. So I have to do something with it. I somehow have to get it. Okay, I can do data augmentation. I can interpolate. I can extrapolate. I can choose other points. I can rotate in space. We're doing all this. Um, but still, it's not exactly where we need to be. 
Um, so maybe we can save some uh, something by transforming the input total strain into its principal components. Would we mean th minus three variables? But somehow it also takes all stability from us. It, uh, training always uh, deviates. In the end, it never converges. Yeah, so we might also take, uh, yeah, offload more tasks from the neural network, do some pre-computation and so on, and reduce just the task that the neural network has to perform and maybe just give it the backstress development or something like that. On the other hand side, here's a similar task, but more complicated, which is when we look at concrete. When we look at concrete, that is also subject to damage. Then you have concrete damage plasticity, where the flow rule, by the way, is non-associative. Luckily, we have seen previously that the associativity of the flow rule is the one regularization that we don't need for the stability of our network. It is a coincidence and sparked actually the idea to go to concrete. Um, so, some other things that are new and special to concrete. The evolutions for tension and compressions are different. I cannot just close the loop or invert and am basically correct, no. This is for tension. You have an elastic phase, roughly elastic, like linear elastic, then something cracks and it totally breaks down quickly. And the other version is under compression. Then you, when you take concrete, you can put a lot of pressure on it. Then at some point, some air holes or some spaces are compressed and it's getting a little bit smaller, but still the stress is rising. And then the structure is breaking down and it's crumbling together until you're basically on the totally compressed amount of stones and sand. So you have compressed everything that was in the structure of the concrete. And then all that is left is you pressing on stones and you still have, have something left here, but the building or the structure you wanted to analyze is gone long ago, or even the concrete went to the side and you cannot longer, longer pr press on a lot of it. Depends on the measurement. Ah, yeah, by the way, measurements are quite complicated and only indirect. So you have this flexural branding of a slab where we just uh, do this uh, karate thing, but by machines. And you have the other option where we uh, are pressuring from the side. And anyway, we're cracking it quickly. And before that, we cannot observe a lot. And then you try to derive some parameters for the uniaxial behavior that you cannot measure directly, especially not for tension. And um, those are not accurate. There are some invented uh, trickery factors in there. And also when you do this conventional modeling for finite elements method, it's mesh independent. So it's a huge problem to efficiently do it. You have to, um, yeah, how to say it? You have to tweak parameters a lot until it's working and you cannot explain why those parameters have the values you assign to them. So in the end, to close the loop when you go in a cyclic way, maybe you have this kind of stress strain behavior, which is quite complicated. And now it would be cool if you had a neural network that could help you with finding this curve and could be directly used from those multi-axial and complicated tests and the observations to train the total neural network as a six-dimensional model. So for all directions, everything is in there and we don't even have to think about manual tweaking parameters. <clears throat> okay, for the... Um, to, to have also tensional and compressional data, one after the other, in your data set and to find uh, enough data, you could do the following. You could take such a slab of concrete and do your flexural test, but don't crack it completely, just start until it's cracking a little bit. And meanwhile, observing it with the camera from the side and see how much deformation you have. The process to recover the data is a little bit more complicated. I will 
uh, sketch an example of how to do it later. But for the moment, let's just think we are doing all of this with finite elements method and uh, have the complete uh, pairs of uh, displacements and stresses and forces and everything is here. And then you have the following behavior. We have the first initial crack, then we turn the slab around or here in the simulation, we press from the other side and then you get a second crack up here, which is going down. And um, then you have a relatively complex behavior in this slab. But when you simulate this, you see a certain mesh dependency, which means that it's not converging with a finer mesh, but it's diverging or oscillating because the conventional model has some trouble there. Well, it was enough to generate some training data that we could put on a neural network, which has, again, a hidden dimension of 64 with two layers of tongue and hyperbolicus activation functions, a tiny, tiny network, uh, 2,000 epochs with a batch size of 256 and a standard atom optimizer gives us those loss curves when parametrizing the weights of the damage uh, losses in different ways, but you see the curves basically look all the same, so we just weigh them all with one, everything is fine. And you see kind of convergence after a bit more than 4,000 epochs, after 2,000, yeah, the loss goes down a lot. You could also train more, probably. But let's just take this and go on and see the results. And actually, I was very surprised when I saw these results from my master's student because they're extremely good. So initially, she just gave the one time step, but the whole previous time step information was from the training data. So it was a perfect setup. The neural network just had to give one increment. Of course, the data looked very good. Then I told her, OK, give me the whole time sequence that the neural network has to deal as if it would be in a finite element simulation. And this is this history dependent curve, which is the color uh, green. And you see all curves are met perfectly. There's no instability in the neural network when using on unseen test data. Also here, the damage curve, order of 10 to the power of minus one. Uh, so perfectly met. Now, when you dig deeper, so the compression, th this is a tensile test, so the compression damage is very, very small. It occurs also in the conventional model, but very small values, uh, order of magnitude 10 to the power of minus three. So 1% of the uh, tensile damage. And we see here some deviation. So we have a deviation of maybe 50% uh, of 10, 50% of 1%, which means half a percent. It's absolutely astonishing model quality. After what we've seen with plasticity in metals. Here the same under compression, same behavior. So only the values that are much smaller have a certain drift. The other curves are met in an accuracy that is astonishing. Yeah. So what's to t uh, tell here? Ah, yeah. Uh, that means that was the end of the concrete, and now I promised to show how to gather such data amounts for machine learning and material modeling, which is automatic material characterization. It is done and can be done analytically, and it can be used to generate more training data samples, more point data points that you can put into our machine learning. Other than before, we don't have a stress strain curve that we put in, like no uni actual test. We deform a body in 2D or 3D. So we put on some forces. We can measure the displacement field optically by a camera and then put, do some digital image correlation, and that's it. So we can just observe optically how something deforms under certain boundary conditions. So we have the displacement field U. And now we also know that the minimum potential energy principle has to apply. That's the base rule. That's the PDE which all those bodies follow. So the only question that is left here to somehow determine a solution is the material model 
which is in this function represented by the energy function psi. Uh, let's go through this formula for a moment. We have a potential energy that is given by an integral of the strain energy density minus po probably body forces, but we can cancel them out when we are quasi-static. So just the strain energy density over the volume minus the boundary integral of the forces at the boundary times the displacement. So that's it. That's what we have to solve. And we can directly also use this for the neural network, which I will explain, uh, called the deep energy method. And we can represent the strain energy density function depending on the deformation gradient f by another neural network. For example, a constitutive artificial neural network. For concrete and metal plasticity, it would be more complicated. It would be several values for um, strain energies because you have the plastic potential, you have the elastic potential, and so on. For hyperelastic materials, it's just one function. And then from this function, you can derive the stresses with respect to the deformation gradient. So that's also a cool use of the autograd function when we are doing all of this in a neural uh, framework, which would roughly look like this. We have the deformation gradient, take some invariants from them and pass them through a bunch of predefined functions. That is the complete network what is seen here. Yeah? So this is the size with which usually hyperelastic materials like rubber are characterized. And then in the end, we calculate as a sum the strain energy density and can do the autograd application here. Now, let's talk about the deep energy method. I promised you I will explain. We have the neural network. The input information is the position, is a position in space in the body, which can be one, two, or three dimensional, depends. Then we are just having our whatever kind of network. It does not even need to be a neural network, can be a Kolmogorov Arnold network, can be a radio basis function, whatever. But it has to be parameterized. In the end, we get some idea for a displacement function, but we will bring in the boundary conditions by a kind of transformation. So when we know that there's a point where no displacement will happen, we can multiply it with a function that is zero there, so no displacement will happen automatically. Then we calculate, based on our material model, the potential energy functional, and then we know that this has to be minimized, so put it into Autograd, uh, put it into Adam and let it run. And you see here the example for a beam that is deformed by a force. So that principally works, now, that is the graph on how to bring it all together. We have the um, samples of the field, the x coordinates, then we pass it through deep energy method and use in this deep energy method a CNN to calculate the strain energy density, and the rest is complicated convolution of calculation graphs, which makes it necessary to use torch up torch opt because you cannot directly use the normal torch package to calculate the gradients for optimization there. Okay. Now, let's take one, this is just an example. We take one target um, model that looks like this and define some parameters and then simulate by standard DEM how a beam would deform under some loads. And then we can say, okay, now we take a CNN that has 12 parameters. We only have here two parameters, so it should learn something that is similar to this two parameter function and makes several parameters zero. And let's see if we can get close to the original deformation. And after 800 epochs, you can see here the red given deformation and the blue dots for the predicted deformation are basically hard to distinguish, so the deformation is met very well. And then we have trained the CANN 
Here is the complete uh, function representing that network. And you can see, okay, we have some small parameters here, but um, one, two, three, four, five parameters are non-zero. Okay, one is very small. In the end, if you plot this behavior uh, together again with the original data, you see basically no difference. So we can find out this material behavior just by simulating with a DEM and a CANN uh, based on, it was now with four or six cases, I think. This one was with four load cases. We have another one with six load cases, but you have a very, very small number of measurements that you need because we can get so much data out of all the points by the digital image correlation. So we evaluate now the whole sample, not only the outer behavior, but every point in the sample. And that means we can set up the whole network for material characterization. We can find out how to just go from, I give you four, five, six samples of a new material. You do some observations with it, then you let the machine run, and in the end you get out a quite proper uh, material model, which you can then use for finite elements method for DM or whatever uh, analysis that you want to do. Our problems currently are, we have to counter data hunger that can be done by data augmentation. Uh, the next step will be to use pre-training with surrogate data and then train on the actual measurement data. And we try to reduce the parameter space, maybe KANs will help. Of course, we always want to improve performance by hyperparameter optimization, by new machine learning architectures, and may also hardware-oriented optimizations because you can always get something out there. And a generalization and combination of methods could bring us to go over different material types like aluminum, steel, concrete, hydrogels, and so on. We can look into inelastic, inelastic CANN, which is exactly for plastic material behavior, or we yeah, do some other energy-based modeling of plasticity. And in the end, we can then convert, do a converged energy-based modeling. So put everything together, make everything neural, and see how that works, and optimize uh, then everything together. That's the idea. Now. That's it. The talk is open for questions. <laughs> Hannah, are you still there? Probably not. All right. Many years or months have been working? How, yeah, how long? Team. Yeah, it's a whole team of students working for him. Uh, I started working on this. I mean, okay, let's, let's take the part where I worked on this, on understanding the topic, and then we're not doing the neural application. Then we have left two and a half years. And also, yeah. Furthermore, there are basically everything I have shown here has been also a topic or part of a thesis work or of a project work and so on. I sometimes convert the deep energy method and the derivatives we are doing for years now um, and, and keep on improving it. The performance is still only good in certain cases. There's a lot of uh, dependence on the initialization. Oh. Um, this flow chart of that work, mm -hmm. Tonya came up with it, no. or is it a combination of everything everybody does? No, 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 no. You combined everything together. No, that is uh, 
<laughs> but here was one of the persons who were like, okay, let's talk about the topics, and then he vanished, and then later oh, okay. he came back with a solution. Um, you know, that is what happened. So the inner network is the BEM, the outer optimization is for the CAMM. So you basically yeah. combine these two networks in a fairly complicated word. Yeah, so did he tell you nested. how he came up with the structure? Did he use any inspiration from some other um, papers or from the actual flowchart for the FBM is working or how you calculated like the traditional methods? How did he come up with this? Or is it like what I did, trying it until it works? It's a mixture of both. So, first of all, when you want to connect them, the C, A, and N would be coupled into the DEM. Use it as a material model, that's it, just for the type function. And then you would have it inside. Now you need to train also the C, A, and N. And the idea was, uh, okay, let's spend a... Increase. I remember we had two or three good uh, discussion rounds uh, for setting up this uh, cycle or this graph, but none of them was directly working because the problem is you cannot, you cannot use in a backward function or when you, for backward yes, but when you want to do the best with it in optimizer, you cannot use a loss function that has already been done or partially done to an optimizer. You cannot have this cycle, and, and in the end, not worse, you cannot use a cycle for your optimization. But even this, for flow to an optimizer and then going here, it's not working with the standard methodology. So the idea of me uh, would then have been to do some uh, separate cycles that are then iteratively asked or buried. Uh, but then he found the torch of library that can do this, and then he designed it. Okay. Torch of is an extension of the fire torch that allows for several uh, gradient computation and several use of a gradient to optimize it. So in the end, it's cool. It's, it's absolutely surprising. It's actually also surprising that it doesn't work. How network. does he train this network? What do you mean? How? I mean, how? much computational force do you need to train such a network? So we have 800 epochs on the outer CAMM inside the VM. So the inner epochs of oh, the VM did, he, did he use uh, uh, some computational Yes, for persons. But inside were 125,000 epochs. So over all computational effort, roughly is two and a half days on the question. At least that's what I estimated on my oh, I, I wrote, or he wrote, I'm not sure, somehow this number, two and a half days. It can parameters where the inside network? Say again? How much parameters were inside the network? Parameters? Yeah. Uh, that is the second. Like 20? The outer one has 12, maximally. The inner one is a DEM. I'm not sure how big he had it. Uh, this has a few thousand, like 64 to the power of no, 64 square times 6 or so, plus a bit. Wait a second. Let's say 65 by 65 by 6 layers or something would be 25,000, like 30,000. So the deep energy method network has 10,000 parameters and the material model has 12. The problem is that the deep energy method in itself doesn't converge well. So what he did uh, was adapting it, um, improving, doing some hyperparameter optimization, and the results he got together with the CAN and are impressive. The accuracy got out there was very. And I'm, I'm more confused about how long it takes, how long the time it was. It takes training a new network takes a lot of time. Yeah, but this is very small. It's like. 
it's not a tiny model, because at least what we are seeing right now is tiny, but the other part is, is not this one, not a tiny one, it's also more kind of large model. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at this, the problem is not in the pure training of the model, it's not the forward pass is extremely fast. The backward pass takes some time, but he has here the problem. So for him, the problem is much bigger. Here's the problem of the double backward pass, which is complicated and which is not really efficient. But even my plasticity model that I presented, which is also in the same level of tininess, it takes eight hours, or let's say five, four when I reduce the amount of data and get down a little bit. You have to see which amount of data I'm putting in. I have 20,000 by 480 data points times six for the strain components, and then I have current total strain, former plastic strain, and back stress. And I want to get out uh, six, 12 values for the increments. So the amount of data to process, and then afterwards to calculate the loss function out of this, this is what takes time. But the question is, train our models during the week and hope that it doesn't crash. Yes, we do it all the time. And overnight. <laughs> overnight, uh, overnight. And so, so see this, this. So you, will, you, you will train them on your, on your private. Oh, uh, I have trained them on the high HPC computer, but they're not parallelizable over several cores because they are so small. So they do not even parallelize well over several cores on one die, let alone different machines in the, the cluster. Uh, I tried. The DEM you can parallelize on a graphics card when it's quick enough. The material training is again too small or not easily parallelizable so that it does not work faster on a graphics card. So we are left with, a, let's say, two core, two CPU core are its peak performance. Um, and that's the problem. It's not parallelizable as a problem too far. We have all the time we have this in the time. All the time. We are always scooping us. Multi body simulation, horrible. You cannot parallelize. Easy. Really hard. Uh, I won't really work this not on model set now. This is not otherwise. Eight graphic cards. Again? Eight graphic cards from Nvidia. Yeah, that's different then. Of course the so so the, the scaling works not linear, very non linear. to the dark side of mechanics. Yeah, once you're over the threshold of, of scaling, once the overhead of adding a graphics card is not important anymore, then okay, fine. I mean, with the Tesla card, I might be a bit quicker for the plastic model. We just have consumer cards, 47 PPI. And AWS gives some support. Again? AWS usually gives some features. It's what we have done. Yeah, for a very, very limited time. <laughs> Yeah, but how many hours of runtime is that? If you are able to run to, to fetch that together, um, then I think it's five or six US dollars per hour. Yeah, uh, eight on hundred. Mm -hmm. so. We should talk about it with then you could look into it. Yeah. No, we can just create an account and use it. And if AWS does not give enough, then ask NVIDIA and then go back to AWS and then go back to NVIDIA. If, if your university has, has none, so the two branches has no um, large amount. So Darmstadt has, has at least one chair in the, what is it, uh, computational chemistry or so? Uh, which is doing, uh, which has an own cluster, and they also have the graphics card and are doing kind of uh, parallelization, but the conventional way, not from neural networks. Um, but at least one share has it, 
a node. Not the whole university, but the chair. Right? The IT department has, has a yeah. new cluster, six, like six months ago it was built, and there have multiple hundreds of data on it. Multiple hundreds? Yes, they have like um, half a data center. We, don't, we have a bunch of, like a few dozens of different graphics cards in our clusters. This was a large project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can you easily get onto it? Um, Is it a tier one to a three cluster? What, what do you mean? The uh, research cluster architecture is uh, based in three tiers. Tier, I'm not sure which number, I think tier one is the highest. The lowest tier is university clusters, which is basically free to the whole university. You just have to say, I want to calculate on this. I'm a student, I'm a research assistant. You write to them, they give you an account, and then you can just put your task on there and see if there's space to calculate and it's immediately and running. If not wrong. Like yeah, yeah, this this kind of tier. But no, ours is free for students once it's uh, registered. But the next tier is then regional cluster. We will have to apply for it and have certain criteria to make. You have, uh, and, and they're much bigger and they have much more um, oversight from this, uh, specialists working in the data center. And so they are then look, checking your code, checking your project. You have to apply, you have to wait a lot of time. And if you don't know what you're doing, then the waiting time is higher than the compute time. And um, then you get access, and then you can have your space and can run. And the tier one is like national super cluster where they have a bunch of them over the whole sphere. It's not organized by itself. It's organized after the amount of hours that you want to have. Yeah. And the higher that number, the higher the requirements are. Yes, so sure, have, sure. But if you only want to have 100 hours or something like that, then we really can write one email and get access. But is it only for TU Darmstadt or is it for the whole region? That's easy access for students as TU Darmstadt. Yeah. For Hessian students, it's a little bit easier than for everybody else. And for campus students, it will probably be very hard. But for professors, I'm not sure how that works because I remember. Yeah. So, so that, that would be interesting. But ours are definitely the lowest tier, they're just university and market. Yeah, and it's actually also one cluster that's organized like like yours, but I don't know what this concept is. Is any of any interest? Because they yeah. don't have any yeah, students yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like ten years old. This one computer science group at TU Berlin has its own huge cluster yeah, just for yes, this yes. group. Yeah, yeah. Some so, some groups, of course, have it, and then also um, Professor Volker Marke once won a uh, competition. And they got a bunch of cluster machines with back then the fastest NVIDIA machines from Facebook. Uh, and then he donated it to the HPC. Um, but yeah, in the end, there are some special. But finally, um, so on the graphics cards, I have calculated sometimes, not seen a speed up, and then seen everybody is, or somebody are blocking them. And so I have to wait longer than it calculates. And then I did it on CPU. But the university cluster has one advantage. It is like, OK, I'm somewhere in the world just with my laptop. Or um, I don't know. I need a stable computer. I have some problem on my desktop machine. I want something that runs one or two days. And I want to be sure that it runs. And then just put it there and let it run. So it's a stable machine somewhere which has still space on the CPU. Good for that. Not more, not less. Sometimes they are really friendly. It depends a little bit on the fact. But um, if they give you credits, then that's, you, you go there and you have them basically in the same mm -hmm. It takes two minutes. And if you want 100 GPUs, then you have to wait two minutes. And if you want 100 GPUs, then you have to wait one minute. That's what my company is actually doing. We do our own 
Applications ja. But we are also using the spot instances to be run on machines that are already spot. Machines that are already too expensive or whatever. Yes. May not be less than just there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, but this kind of hardware is not the, the biggest point. You can get out of it, of it, but the main point is out of the data presentation, the data cleaning, the data format. And not only, only the data, but also set up necessary to represent the data. So we will find it one day. When do you go back to the land? To what? To Berlin? Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah, in over a week. But we go to another conference in Macedonia next week. It's high. On Sunday. Hmm? On Sunday. Sunday. And I decided to stay at my cousin's house for a couple of days to visit Darmstadt. So, yeah. And take the airplane from Frankfurt and the Berlin so I don't have to take with air trials. <laughs> yeah, the comic book airline. <laughs> that was a nice place. I live in Utah. Sounds beautiful. Direkt vorne am Start. Einmal in Richtung Odenwald. Es hat keine Durchgangsstraße, es hat keine Autobahn. Das ist also niemand. Außer den Bewohnern. Ja. Und, äh, als ich eingezogen bin, haben die Nachbarn bei meinem Winter nachgefragt, warum da ein falsches Auto steht. Warum zum Geier bist du da hingezogen? Oh, also also bin ich einfach im vierten Stock gezogen. <lacht> so. Kannst du das Fenster aufmachen? Du hast nichts. Also irgendwann hast du ein paar Vögel. Also wenn man den Hinzieht, das bin erst hingezogen, ich habe gar nichts gehört. Ich habe gedacht, es wäre irgendwas kaputt. Was wäre krank oder so. Gar nichts. Ich habe irgendwann gehört man dann die Vögel. Und irgendwann fängt man an, die Müller vorzuhören, wenn die Streit drei Straßen weiter ist. Sehr, sehr entspannt. Naja. So, es ist ein bisschen wild. Na naja, gut, wir sind nur eine halbe Stunde vor der Zeit durch. Ich lade mein Handy noch auf. Ich bin zu Hause. 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 Ich bin zu Hause.